Okay, we left off in a video we did yesterday on Elijah. Uh, we left off where Elijah had called down fire from the Lord, and the Lord did this miraculous thing, and he turned many of the Israelites' hearts back to him. But we're going to go go to chapter 19 and read through the second portion of this video broadcast that we did yesterday. And so we're going to start with verse uh, verse 1 of chapter 19, and it says, Now Ahab was told Jezebel everything Elijah had done, and how he killed all the prophets with the sword, the false prophets that was, the prophets of Baal. He had uh, God had sent fire on the altar that Elijah made the sacrifice on and consumed it, and we see uh, Ahab runs off and snitches to Jezebel about what happened. So, uh, so Jezebel sent messengers, a messenger to, El to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life, and when he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there, and while well, he, he himself went on a day's journey into the wilderness, he came to a broom bush sat down under it and prayed he might die. I had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. At once the angel, an angel touched him and said, Get up and eat. He looked around, and there was by his head some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up, ate and drank, strengthened by that food. He traveled for forty days and forty nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of the Lord, and there he went into a cave to spend the night. So we see uh, Elijah had this extremely wonderful mountaintop experience, and the Lord called down fire and consumed the altar, and many people turned back to the Lord as a result. But, you know, we see Elijah hit really a, a dark place of discouragement right after. And so, so we talked about in yesterday's video, sometimes after a great victory, there is a great temptation or a great moment of weakness that we have. We get tired, we get exhausted. We, uh, we may get discouraged and doubt whether the Lord has really used us in a particular situation when, you know, it was really clear before that he was using us. And then we lose sight of that and we just feel like, well, you know, maybe God didn't really use me after all. That's how Elijah felt. He felt also ashamed, probably, that he ran from that wicked woman Jezebel, that Queen Jezebel. He probably thought to himself, well, I should have been more bold and courageous. I ran off like a coward. Which we, we got to understand, Elijah was a human being just like us. You know, the Bible is not full of superheroes that are supernatural people in and of themselves, but just people who God greatly used and empowered by his spirit to do what they needed to do. So the only superhero in the Bible itself is Jesus Christ himself and the Lord God himself. And so... You see, that's the only real super person in the Bible. Throughout Scripture, we see people who God used greatly. They had their weaknesses. If you just take a look at some of the judges God used to deliver Israel. Uh, Jephthah, for example, he became a mighty judge that helped deliver the Israelites from the hands of their enemies at the time. And Jephthah... Uh, Jephthah, I think, was facing some problems with confidence, and he said he made a foolish prayer where he vowed something he shouldn't have. He said, Lord, if you only deliver them into my hands, I will sacrifice the first thing that comes running out of my house. He probably thought a, an animal would come running out of his house. When, after the Lord gave him victory, uh, his own daughter was the one that came running out of the house to see him, and so he was devastated at that. And so we see these Bible characters they had their flaws, that's for sure. They had their flaws. There is no one in Scripture who did not have a flaw except Jesus Christ himself. Jesus Christ was blameless and perfect, and he is our ultimate example. But God has given us a lot of characters in Scripture that he used greatly. And the Bible isn't 
uh, ashamed to mention some of those struggles that they had. And so I think that should be great comfort to us as modern believers to realize that these people in the Bible had their flaws and weaknesses. Take David, for example, a mighty warrior, man after God's own heart. He made his mistakes. He slipped in some ways. We see in David's life he uh, committed adultery and arranged to have Uriah murdered. And, you know, he repented. But, you know, he still suffered the consequences of that. And later on in David's life, when he's nearing the end of his life, David uh, counts the fighting men. He took a census, and the plague of the Lord broke out as a result from that because David, it was likely David was exalting and boasting in his own military power rather than the Lord his God. And so God had to discipline him for his pride. But we see... Throughout the scripture, there is people, people that God used greatly. They had their weaknesses. Even Paul, and someone like Paul, there was an incident where uh, he was testifying about the gospel, and the high priest demanded he be struck. And so, basically, he was slapped across the face, and in his frustration and anger, he says, Well, God will strike ye, you whitewashed tomb. And so Paul has a moment where he loses his temper with the high priest, and then the guy next to him says, How dare you insult God's high priest like that? And Paul said, I'm sorry, I didn't know it was the high priest. It is written, you shall not speak evil against the ruler of your people. So Paul caught himself. He said, yeah, I had a little outburst there. I was kind of upset that you ordered I be slapped. I apologize for disrespect disrespecting the high priest. Now, this high priest guy wasn't a very nice guy. He wasn't a good guy. He was somebody that God would definitely strike eventually. He was somebody that God would send to eternal destruction. But, you know, we see an example in that passage where even if someone is in a place of authority and they're not acting right, there's still a level of respect we should give authority, even if they're bad authority. You know, I think that's the example we see there. But we see these people in the Bible were not perfect people. Peter, for example, he denied the Lord three times, and he felt so ashamed he wept bitterly. And so we see these characters in the Bible. We often think they're some super, supernatural people that were perfect, and that's just not the, that's just not the account Scripture gives us of these people. They had flaws and weaknesses, as we see here with even Elijah. Elijah was one of the... <clears throat> Even uh, uh, today, the Jews greatly respect Elijah and people like Moses. But Moses, Moses had his mistakes too. Moses lost his temper at the very end of wandering in the wilderness. And God said, speak to the rock. And Moses got pretty ticked off at the people, I think. I think that's really what went down. And he basically, he basically bashed the rock with his staff two times. I think he had a little bit of a... An outburst of frustration with those stiff-necked people, and God's like, okay, because you didn't honor me as holy in the sight of these Israelites, you know, I'm not going to allow you to lead them into the promised land. You're going to die before you actually lead them in. And so we, we think about these people in Scripture, and we think they just had it all together. They were perfect, and that's just not so. And that's not true about any of us either. We have our flaws and our weaknesses, but I think God can still use us. And we'll see what it took to get Elijah back up and going, you know. All at once, an angel came and touched him and said, Get up and eat. He looked around, and there by his head was some baked bread over the hot coals and the jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again. So Elijah's like, Thanks for the meal. I'm going to take a little nap. I'm just going to feel sorry for a little while. No, but the angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat. The journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank, strengthened by that food, and he traveled for 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, uh, the mountain of God, and there he went into a cave to spend the night. Okay, now let's just think about that. The angel came and brought him a meal. It was basically curbside delivery from an angel. He's like, here, your delivery of some food. Eat and drink. Yeah, but I think there's a, a few a few things to look at in that passage. For one, the angel came and touched him. It doesn't say he just came and shouted, get up! He touched him, and he woke up and said, 
the angel said, get up and eat. He looked around, and there by his head was some bread baked over the hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. Well, when we think about the Word of God, we hear in Deuteronomy, for example, it says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Okay? So Elijah needed some physical food to help nourish his physical body to give him strength. And he also needed some water to refresh from that. But you know, oftentimes we have spiritual journeys that are long and difficult. We have to go through trials and they're like a long distance through from one point of the trial to the next point. So God encourages us to get up, eat the bread of the Word of God, nourish our souls, feed our spirits, drink the living water as Jesus Christ said I am the living water and so basically our truest source of strength comes from the bread of the Word of God and the water the living water called Jesus Christ and so when we feed our spiritual self uh, we find refreshment and uh, Elijah did need some physical food because God's like, basically, you're going to need the energy that this food is going to give you to get, to travel to where I need you to go. There's a physical, actual journey you need to take, and you need to eat. Okay, so God's basically saying, come on, eat. And so he ate and it nourished his body, okay? And so, you know, not all of our, our trials are going to be like physical ones that we have to, not like Elijah. Elijah had to travel for a distance. He had need, needed physical food. God provided that literal need that he had. But some of our trials are very spiritual in nature, and we might not be doing what Elijah did, where we have to travel 40 days and 40 nights in the literal sense, but that could be represented a tiv of a time going through a hard season and the days and the nights that we have to go through that difficult season we need that spiritual strength to get through it and so we should always be especially in a time of crisis seeking the Word of God and reading the Word of God feeding our spirits and our souls so he got up eventually the angel came and touched him again and said come on get up and it was like Elijah at the first time said, oh, laid down five more minutes, you know, you know that card when you've woken up from a nap and you're just like, oh, I just want to sleep, you know. So the angel came gently and said, come on, Elijah, get back up. And he said, get up and eat and drink for the journey is much too, is too much for you. So he said, you're going to need your strength to make this journey, okay? So he got up and ate and drank, strengthened by the food. He traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb and the mountain of the God. There he went into a cave. But I think the uh, significance of the angel touching him, it, it says in the second verse where the second time the angel touched him, it said the angel of the Lord. Now a lot of times when we see the verse, the word in scripture, the phrase, should I say, the angel of the Lord, a lot of people think that means, that means Jesus Christ, a prefiguration of Jesus Christ manifesting himself as the literal angel of the Lord. There are angels of the Lord, which are like just normal angels, but then in some texts it says the angel of the Lord. And when Joshua encountered the angel of the Lord, uh, he asked, who are you? He's like, I am commander of heaven's armies. And so... You know, a lot of scholars think that the angel, uh, when you see the term the angel of the Lord, it e means Jesus Christ, a prefiguration of Jesus Christ. But, you know, regardless of how you interpret that, I mean, it's, it's uh, the timeless truth is sometimes we do need a fresh touch from Jesus Christ. We see this, this angel touched him. We need... Jesus to touch our lives daily. When we're feeling weak and exhausted, a fresh touch of his grace is sometimes all we need to make the rest of the difficult journey that we have in front of us. So we should always be uh, like praying, God, give me a fresh touch of your spirit today, a fresh touch of your grace, a fresh filling. I think that's very important. Our days, we can't go through a single day without being filled with the spirit. If we're going to have a successful journey, we've got to continually keep coming back and being filled with his power and his presence. 
and we'll do part three of this message tomorrow. God bless.